something along those lines. It was very generic, uh, not a specific threat, but disturbing enough that we wanted to find out who put it up there and, and follow through. After he was interviewed, Mike immediately took to his online chat groups, commenting that the FBI didn't think it was a serious threat with a winking eye emoji. His online presence grew again, and he participated in several chat groups and was very active on social media accounts. Several of the forums he posted on included him sharing his respect for Hitler. His account names were alarming. He called himself Future Mass Shooter, and also the name of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooter. One of the blogs that Mike maintained was AMOG, which translates to Alpha Male of the Group. Mike liked to joke about the Columbine shooting, but complained bitterly about living in New Mexico and the lack of opportunities he was afforded. Mike referred to his father as a, quote, fat, lazy idiot who watches Fox News all day, and described his mother as a, quote, psycho hillbilly drunk from Florida who's really mentally ill. Later, investigation showed that Mike even had a note, which detailed a schedule of the shooting. We, uh found this in his home, in his trash can, in his room, and it's a, it's a note. It says, number one, 620, uh, work, and I can't, oh, it's, it's packed up, and then 7 to 7.30 is prep, 7.30 to 8, walk, and 8, die. There was some communication between Mike and another young man that had conducted a mass shooting at a shopping mall in Munich, July of 2016, that was also discovered later. Yes, his fixation on mass shooting events, and the shooters that committed them, was alarming. Yet, no substantial investigation was done, or action taken. Mike worked locally at a gas station as a general clerk. His co-workers reported that he was quiet most of the time yet he started becoming more talkative in the weeks leading up to the shooting. He informed his co-workers that he did a lot of work online and wrote a blog about politics, but he never mentioned his desire to hurt anyone. One particular employee at the gas station said she thought Mike was an amiable kid and had perfect manners. Natalie Hubbard was an assistant manager, so she had a lot of interactions with Mike. It was reported that he never had any visitors at work except his brother, but again, That isn't particularly unusual. Mike did talk about guns with Natalie, telling her that he recently purchased a Glock. Despite this, he was so pleasant that it didn't seem off to Natalie. Still, Mike's mom thought he was depressed and even went so far as to talk to Natalie about it. When asked, Mike just said that he worked all night at the gas station, and when he got back home, his dad kept him up all day. He was tired. The shift at the gas station was from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., so this made sense. Plus, Natalie thought Mike was a dream employee and someone that got along well with anyone. As her work friendship grew, he confessed that he was a hacker, and the only relationship he had was with his computer. Again, this didn't really raise any flags to his co-worker, and why would it, when examined apart from all the other red flags Mike displayed? He never called off work always picked up extra shifts, and was respectful towards customers and fellow employees, never speaking of violence. He typically wore a hat, specifically a beanie-type cap and dark clothing, but otherwise appeared to be a regular young man to those that worked with him. I can't believe that somebody on my street, he dropped out freshman year, and, you know, apparently that's where he got super unhealthy. Mike was known among his family as one that walked everywhere he went. He didn't have a car, although it appears he obtained a driver's license at some point. He just really liked to walk, sometimes up to 20 miles a day. However, on November 3rd, 2017, Mike's dad drove him to the Sportsman's Warehouse store, where Mike purchased his Glock handgun. Again, this didn't stick out to his dad because the family had gone to the shooting range at least three times before the massacre took place. Would walk down the streets um, talking to himself. I mean, he was just not, he wasn't normal. 
Former classmates recall Mike as quiet in school, speaking with a slight stutter when he spoke. He wore a trench coat then and played a lot of video games. Once again, this doesn't necessarily stick out as odd. He didn't have any criminal history whatsoever, not even a parking ticket. It's just a shame that he wasn't on our our radar. Uh, I don't think he had as much as a traffic ticket or anything else. He was a strange kid who lived in a small yellow home with his parents and walked to and from work every night and played online all day. Aside from his truly problematic online behavior, there really weren't any red flags. Yet, there were. Mike played shooting video games and even practiced precisely how the shooting would happen on a particular video game where you could build malls and schools to match the layout of a specific building, which investigators called dry runs. He bought high-capacity magazines online, along with other ammunition. Mike spent hours upon hours online, posting threats and obsessing over mass murderers. His father reported that Mike was bullied in high school, and Mike was seeing counselors at one time while in school, but that appeared to have stopped when he was expelled. Just before the shooting, Mike sent emails to his parents and brother, which was not typical. The anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack coincided with the date of the shooting, and it was discovered that Mike might have had a relative that died in the attack. But is this enough of a reason to have committed this heinous crime? There was no known mental health breakdown, no slight from a girlfriend or boyfriend, nothing obvious that would set this young man off so terribly that he would act in this manner. No real motive, except, perhaps, notoriety. School resumed at the Aztec High School 11 days after the shooting, on December 18th, 2017. Classes commenced that morning with a special assembly. You know, one of the first steps to healing is accepting the grief. But we have to accept that we're grieving, that we're grieving as a community and as families. The area where the two murders were committed was transformed into a commonplace for students to enjoy. But most importantly, it was dedicated to Casey and Paco. The custodian, Thomas Emery Hill, who went by Emery, was a hero that day. He chased after Mike and screamed that there was an active shooter in lockdown. Those two phrases spurred students and faculty into action immediately and likely spared so many lives. Paco was also a hero, for he too ran down the hallway yelling at Mike, and because Paco's life was stolen by Mike's bullets, the majority of the people in that building went home with their lives intact. What's more? is that despite the rise in school and mass shootings, we, as people, have responded with procedures and training that, when implemented, are proven to save lives. This is bizarre. This is not, uh, this is not traditional police training. Cops are not psychologists, sociologists. They're there to respond to a, to a crime. We're involving to try to get ahead of it, but how do you stop something like this? I mean, I don't know. This is one reason why the Active Shooter podcast is committed to bringing awareness and response measures and finding ways to react safely and responsibly in the face of these deadly tragedies that have become too commonplace. This is one reason why the Active Shooter podcast is committed to bringing awareness and response measures and finding ways to react safely and responsibly in the face of those deadly tragedies that have become too commonplace. This is one reason why the Active Shooter Podcast is committed to bringing awareness and response measures and finding ways to react safely and responsibly in the face of these deadly tragedies that have become too commonplace. Please remember to keep your eyes and ears open, listeners. Even the slightest thing could be the one saving grace. If you see something, say something. If you know something, say something. You never know how many lives you could be saving. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Active Shooter, the podcast. Remember, if you see something, say something. 
There's no telling how many lives you may be saving. A huge thank you to Darren Curtis, who composed some of the music used in this episode. Check him out at darrencurtismusic.com. D-A-R-R-E-N-C-U-R-T-I-S music.com. Active shooter. Reports of an active shooter. Active shooter. Active shooter. of Mass casualty incidents. Make sure to check us out on social media. We have a discussion group on Facebook. Just search for Active Shooter, the podcast discussion group. You can also find us on Instagram at Active the Podcast and Twitter at Podcast Active. For just $1 a month, you can get access to ad-free episodes, early release episodes when available, and a shout-out on the show. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Active the Podcast. Thank you, and be safe. The Menendez brothers. We are talking about Pamela Smart. Andrea Yates. I think that is kind of one of the first things that started my true crime obsession. We're definitely going to be diving into the legal and psychological parts of this case. First of all, you shouldn't be friends with people that ask you to cut up somebody's body. And on the flip side, you shouldn't be friends with somebody who is willing to cut up somebody's body. If she is abusing drugs at 9 and 12 years old, it would make sense that there was some significant abuse going on in the house. That's not normal. Never trust the mother or the lover. Who is a self-professed drug dealer in court? That's why we always say get a lawyer because you just fed them this information that they didn't have and they're now using it against you. Hi everybody, my name's Mary. And I'm Deirdre. And we're from Not Your Normal Murder Podcast. With my experience in psychiatry and my experience in criminal justice, we bring a fresh perspective on small town cases and those cases you can't forget. If you love true crime, a little bit of sarcastic banner, but lots of objective research, come find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. You know what's the best part of Hump Day? There's a new episode every Wednesday. See you there.